So basically we're here in the textile storage facility and we're going to be nerding out and going through boxes and looking at old clothes. And I am lucky enough to have with me today, Christine um, Nazrum. And Christine is the yin to my yang. So um, I have uh, learned a lot about historic clothes from putting together our Fashioning Illinois exhibition, but the one void in my knowledge is that I don't sew. But Christine does. She has a lot of experience uh, sewing historic garments. Um, she's also worked with several archaeological collections of the remnants of historic clothes, which are ma mainly buttons and hooks um, and things like that. So um, together, we're going to go through these boxes and nerd out over the clothes. So just a little bit of background on how the State Museum's collections were assembled. Um, we take in collections both individually, um, piece by piece from people donating them. And most of the garments that you see in here in our textile storage collections area at the Research and Collection Center were um, transfers. We have two very large collections. One was a transfer from Illinois State University and one was a transfer from the University of Illinois. And and um, there are strengths and weaknesses to those collections. Um, the strengths are that they are very comprehensive. We have a lot of great examples. The weaknesses are that um, there's really no provenance. Um, they were collected more as examples of clothing without as much emphasis on the history of who wore them. And also, um, and this is a common feature in museum collections, um, they're not very representative of a broad variety of experience in Illinois. Um, it's a very white collection. Um, most of the garments came from white people, and so people of color are severely underrepresented. So as we go forward, um, the museum is still accepting donations. Um, we prioritize garments that have a powerful story. We like to know who wore it, what their life was like, under what circumstance they wore it. Um, being in good condition is great. And um, of course, we really would like to build up our collection to make it more representative of people of color. Um, so that's saying, I think we are going to dive into a box. So um, we've got a little bit of everything here at the collection. Um, so we're just going to kind of dive in and tell you what we see and um, take you along for our uh, geeky ride here. <laughs> so um, as we're storing collections, um, the most important thing is to um, keep garments um, in a temperature controlled environment. So the temperature in here um, hovers around 66, 67 degrees, and it's a stable humidity um, around 45 degrees. And then clothing likes to be kept in the dark. Um, light damage is cumulative. So the longer something is out in the light, the more it will fade. Um, within these boxes, we make every effort to lay our garments flat. Um, folds put stress on the garments. This isn't always possible just because of the sheer volume we have and the limited amount of space we have, but it's ideal to lay a garment out like this flat and when possible to reinforce um, folds uh, with acid-free tissue paper. So what we're looking at here, Christine, what do we see here? Oh, so this is why I came today. This <laughs> is an 18 teens dress. And it's made out of very fine uh, linen. Um, I thought it was muslin at first, and we, we opened it up just before we started the camera, but it's really super fine, lovely, lovely linen. So am I correct that this is the oldest dress in the collection? This is the oldest dress in our collection. This is, and it's just a classic example of 18 teens fashion, the white muslins, the classic things that you see in the BBC productions of Jane Austen. Um, what I really love about this too is that there's mending, there's a patch right here. Um, this embroidery is lovely. Now, was that hand done? Yes, absolutely. At that time, everything would have been hand done. There were no sewing machines yet. Um, and it looks like, it looks like the closure. Okay, so it's a drawstring on the, the neckline. It looks like this part's missing, but we still have part of the drawstring. And then underneath, there's this lining fabric that's rougher. I don't know if the camera can catch the difference in the two fabrics here, but it's quite stark how rough can you that pull is. It up a little? Oh. 
And I do want to point out that um, before we began, Christine and I both washed our hands. Um, oh, yes. The best practices for handling textiles are um, to have clean hands. Um, we don't wear gloves because when we're working with fine fabrics, and especially if there's buttons or hooks involved, um, the potential of a glove to kind of reduce your tactility and catch on something small and cause damage to the fabric is higher. So it's better if we just use our very clean fingers yeah. to look carefully. We, we scrub in though, we promise. <laughs> so yeah, this is really interesting to me though, because this, this back clearly goes beyond the lining. So probably this over, this overlapped or it was meant to overlap a little bit and then was pinned up the back. Oh, you, interesting. Yeah. I mean, you see there's no buttonholes and I don't even see any remnants of where like a hook and eye might be. Um, there is maybe a little bit of a pinhole right there. Wow. Um, and you found pins in archeological contexts. Oh you? yeah. You, you find a lot of pins in uh, domestic, site archaeological context especially in um when you find like an ash lens yeah. because there are if you drop pins on the floor then you sweep them into the fireplace and then when you clean out the fireplace then the ash goes in the yard then the pins go with it so wow yeah tend to find those there so back in the day people were literally like pinning their garments closed yeah yeah women especially uh men use buttons typically wow but women's Clothing didn't really start to use buttons routinely until, I don't know, 1840s, 1850s. So wow. before that, it was mostly with laces and pins and hooks and eyes. Wow. Yeah, this is a beautiful piece. This is really a beautiful piece. Okay, let's move along. I feel okay. so bad. We could literally do this all day and night. Oh my so gosh, uh, our challenge is going to be to keep it moving and you know, keep you yeah. entertained by looking at different things. Ooh. This one is a beautiful um, kind of iridescent silk dress wow. in green and blue. And what's interesting to me is that it um, it doesn't close in the front. Yeah. So here is my theory, Christine, that I wanted to run by you. Okay. Um, do you think that this could have been like somebody's best silk dress that they modified into a wrapper? Uh, let's see here. Let's do some detective work. And this is the most fun thing about like really researching clothing oh. is when... A lot of these garments, like I said, come to us with no history, so we'll never know who used them. So the detective work that has to be done is on the garment itself, and the garment will show evidence of having been altered over time um, from moved seams or, you know, even the like little holes that pulled threads leave behind. So when you look closely, you can sort of like get the history of the garment itself, even if it's context and it's wearer is lost. Yeah, there's, I mean, I, I like that theory. It certainly seems plausible um, just based on the construction of the lining here, how it's not, you know, it doesn't, it's got hooks and eyes that close here, but it does kind of look like, yeah, somebody maybe spilled something down the front yeah. of the dress <laughs> and then just decided, oh, I'll just cut it down the middle and put this green on. So we have a question about yes. this dress. What time period is this? This uh, kind of says 1850s to me because okay. of the style of the front and also these like pagoda sleeves. Yeah, um, yeah. 1840s were more like narrow to the cuff. Yeah, yeah. And then can you tell what's going on here? Do you see how there's like the different I did see those? that. Yeah. yeah, I don't know. Has this been like let down a couple of times? It's possible. Usually that would be done at the hem. Hmm. Um, so I don't know. It, I mean, that's kind of one of the reasons why I thought, oh, I, I like the idea of it being a modified garment because this is a really super rough seam right here. See that? It's not really finished even. Um, like maybe you were meant to wear a tie over it or something. Oh, so right. there's no waistband here. Yeah. So maybe there was a waistband that's been removed. Maybe they let it down because the seam allowance is only like a quarter inch here. So yeah, maybe there was a lar there was a larger seam allowance here because it's on both sides of that waist seam. Huh. So yeah, that's cool. That's really super groovy. I really love this glazed cotton on the uh, the lining too. That's a 
really characteristic thing of 19th so century. The fact that the glazed cotton on the bottom doesn't match the top, does that indicate that oh, they were that. like constructed of like the skirt maybe and then this lining came later, but yeah. it's not like they were constructed at the same time? That's entirely possible. Yeah, that's you're right. That's weird that they don't match. And yeah, this one's pretty piecemeal too. Look at there's like there's a pocket here, but then there's it's been like grafted together at the top here. Like I don't know. I'm not sure what's going on with this one. It's a weird one, but it's really cool. This this silk is gorgeous. So another question is what is the difference between glazed cotton and polished cotton? Ooh, I have no idea. I understand the terms to be interchangeable, but I don't, you know, like I, I don't, my knowledge isn't that granular of fabric. So it's entirely <laughs> possible I could be wrong. Yeah. But um, as I understood it, they're kind of the same thing. And it refers to this, like, um, is it coated in wax? It's like this waxy coated yeah. um, cotton that's often found like in the lining yeah. to reinforce garments. Yeah. Just kind of keeps the, the sweat away. Okay. All right. Well, we can also literally spend all day on one garment. Oh, oh yeah. So. <laughs> and then this one is to change it up. My personal bias is towards like earlier garments. Um, so in the interest of people who like later 19th century, we wanted to show this ensemble, um, which to me says 1890s based on this high standing collar here and these um, short little sleeves that are kind of like poofed at the edges. Yeah. And by that, it might be a little earlier than that okay. though. I mean, the, the sleeves are a bit small for. It could be, yeah, for like 1880s. Whoa, look at all this. This oh. one is. Um, Grand Magasin du Louvre. So this is a Paris created creation. Wow. That's amazing. Oh yeah, look at the stiff netting on the skirt. That's fun. Make it stand out. And um, this has got characteristic uh, signs of the 1880s, 1890s. This would have been a belt and this hooks around your waist. And so what this is doing is taking the tension off your waist. So when you button up the front here or hook it up with hooks and eyes, it's not like pulling at the hooks and leaving, you know, a gap because that tension is being absorbed inside by the belt. Yeah, it's really genius actually. <laughs> it's, it just completely takes the wear off the front. And then we've got the uh, boning to reinforce kind of the, the structure of the garment yeah. inside. Would this have been whalebone still in this time period or is that an earlier? I think they season? moved on from whalebone. Okay. I think the poor whales were yeah. over hunted by yeah. the 1890s. Yeah. And so, so this is- There's um, been a question, if the box yeah. can be shifted, this direction. Oh, there you go. so they can see it right side up. Oh, yeah. oh. sorry. Uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. Keep the feedback coming yeah. because we are uh, <laughs> learning as we go along too. So what you have is a sort of like over coat, over garment, and oh. then this under skirt here. You can see there's a little like fullness at the waist. So there would have been just a hint of like a um, bustle or um, kind of curve at the back. And you can see how the this front panel was meant to be seen. And then this is just, you know, this would have been hidden by the garment. So, oh, that's so cool. And do you think this has been altered? I mean, like for French couture, it seems like the construction is it's, a little Yeah, that, that's pretty rough stitching there. I don't know about that. Um, the rest of this seems to be fairly nice. Maybe, I mean, this is, this looks like maybe a different hand than this. Maybe this was taken in huh, at okay. some point. And then I don't know about this. That's, I mean, I feel like the people at the Grand Magazine should <laughs> be very proud of this work. I know, right? <laughs> but I mean, the fabrics match the fabrics though, match, so yeah. I don't know. It's been altered. Maybe. 
Yeah, it's kind of the same thing up here where that's it's the, the same fabric as this, but this is stitched a lot finer than this. This is like you gave your seven year old daughter or <laughs> <laughs> you know how to make a seam or something. And what I love about historic clothing is that um, they show so many signs of being mended or altered. Yeah. Um, clothing to us is very, you know, it's off the rack. You wear it until, you know, you get a hole or spill something and then it generally leaves your life. Whereas clothing in the 19th century was an investment of time and resources. And so when it was no longer in style or it didn't fit you, you altered it or you um, remade it to be something more fashionable or you made it over for another person in your household, but it had this very long life. And so over that life, it accumulates evidence of that mending, of that alteration, of that repurposing. And that's part of the detective work that we do when we're looking at this stuff is looking for the men's and the alterations. So there are some suggestions on the blue green dress that maybe it was maternity or it was two pieces that were once separate and then they were brought back together. Yeah, that's a good thought too. Interesting. Yeah, yes. that's definitely a potential in, in any of these pieces of women's wear that they were altered for maternity use. Yeah, and that was, I mean, there was no ready-made maternity garments. What women would do was they would take their clothes, they would alter them for pregnancy, and then when childbearing was done, they would return them. That's why um, maternity clothes are fairly rare in um, museum collections. And in fact, the two that we have on exhibit, um, both the mothers died in childbirth. And I wonder if that's why the garments survived because that yeah. woman didn't survive to alter her yeah. clothing back into everyday wear. Yeah. Yeah. That's a great story. Okay. So let's keep moving. Deductive process is kind of trying to relate it to what I know about grown up clothes. Yeah. Yeah. And a lot of the times, um, kids, Fashion is really did kind of mirror um, adults, so okay. there's definite stylistic Ooh. trends. Oh my goodness, that looks early. Do you have a date for that one? I don't, but I want to say 1840s, maybe? I mean, I would seriously buy like 1790 for that <laughs> style, but, um, but yeah, this print it does look like maybe a roller print of cotton so yeah 30s or 40s maybe it's got the little um the band here oh yeah wow that's fine work that's really nice so speaking of fastener, fasteners for clothing i think oftentimes for small children like this yeah. um you do see ties just yeah because you know you're not gonna like pin closed your infant's garments so yeah. with an adult and no, with sharp is... objects near a baby. So. <laughs> yeah, that's much easier. Oh, look at the tape on the inside of the waist there. That's nice. Very cool. Gosh, that's great fabric. I'd love to have some of that. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely so an early kind of um, a unisex garment, probably. Yeah. There wasn't a lot of um, gender differentiation between boys and girls early on. So this could have been a boy or a girl, just kind of in a standard you know, kid's dress. Yeah. Uh, a comment is that it also gave you flexibility to grow yes. using yeah. your ties. That's a good point. Awesome. Too. Yes. Excellent point. Kids grow so fast. <laughs> yes, Maybe we should do. put kids in tie clothes again. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I love this. We'll just move to the side and put them all back. Ooh, look at so, this someone thing. has asked, How could you tell boys and girls' dresses apart? Would you, I would assume, use of frills on the bodice and sleeves? Um, when they're very young, I think they're pretty much identical. Um, by the time a little boy is like three to seven, he might still be in a dress. Um, but they tend to be like, there's like, military, you know, kind of braid. They look a little bit more like little like suits with skirts. Um, but for an infant, you know, that's like totally the same. Yeah, infant stuff was probably pretty simple and designed to as far as the fabric because you just wanted to bleach whatever. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. So the spit up and everything off. So we have a little, um, and this one's awesome. This is a little sailor suit. That's adorable. So I don't have a date, but I want to say either 
somewhere between 1898 and 1918, because um, kids' fashions were very influenced by the Spanish-American War and then World War I, so putting little kids in sailor outfits. And even adults had the sailor look going on with all their age. Yeah, some of that pers- the collar style persisted into the 40s even, actually. But, uh, oh, yeah, look at that. It's like a the... hat and twill. Yeah. And then it's got little buttons on the waistband so did that button onto the top i don't know and maybe these things don't even go together i don't know maybe it's maybe it, there was another piece to it that's just a waistband that just had like buttons that attached but it's no longer here i don't know what I love about this is the Marshall Fields and Company Boys Outfitting. Um, so we're getting in the early 20th century into the era of ready-made clothing. Um, for most of human history, mothers had made their own children's clothes, and probably a lot of moms were still making their kids' clothes at this point, but now you have the option of ready-made clothes. Um, and it's interesting, I think, to think about who made this. Um, and what conditions they're working under. Um, You know, that 1898 to 1918 is like right in the wheelhouse of the triangle shirtwaist era. So, you know, there are, um, basically it's the era of the sweatshop. And so a lot of garment producers like Marshall Fields would sort of subcontract out to um, groups of garment workers working under terrible conditions, you know, um, in people's homes. So there's a story of, you know, labor history and and probably exploitation. Oh, yeah. I mean, absolutely. This was the beginning of fast fashion. I mean, it it became super cheap at any cost to the workers. And so someone suggested that the buttons on the shorts could be for where suspenders would go. Oh, suspenders. Okay. Underneath. That makes sense. I never think about suspenders for some reason. Yeah, that's a great thought. Yeah. And then, yeah, because there's four buttons on the front there. Yeah, that's that's a very good thought. Thank you very much. Okay, we're moving along. All right. Ooh. And this one, um, I did see a date. I think this was about 1880. Okay. Um, which makes sense to me you see this like kind of verticality this like yeah. top to bottom look in the 1880s yeah oh my goodness look at how all every little line of this braided trim is stitched on mm. by hand really finely oh God, you can like feel the mother's love i know this. i know it's great this is linen too isn't it and what I love is that the buttons are missing. Yeah. So and speaking to that life cycle of clothing, yeah. when this was put away, the buttons were harvested. Yep. And so those buttons are on a different garment, you know, somewhere. Um, and Christine, you were, when you're trying to recreate archaeological context, that's kind of the problem because you don't know where those buttons came from. No, exactly. You know, everybody still today even has a button jar where you you recycle buttons. And if one falls off and you lose it, you just stick another one on that's about the same size and shape. It might even be a different material. So it can be frustrating going through archaeological collections, trying to figure out something about the people that lived on the site based on the number and type of buttons. Uh, really, the only thing that that says a whole lot about the inhabitants are military buttons. Hmm. Um, but everything else is just like this. It's just, you know, they're they're reused so many different times. And does this say unisex garment to you? Do you think a boy or a girl would have worn? Yeah, this? I would think so. Yeah, I mean that's it's pretty plain. It's not. Yeah, it's nothing that I would say is super frilly or anything oh, oh look at that 1870 okay, okay i'll buy that too yeah absolutely eastern illinois university that's nice that's nice fine um so a couple of questions one can you explain about why you're not wearing glove skin Yes. I'm um, sorry. So um, the best practices for dealing with textiles is to have clean hands, but not gloves. And the reason being um, a lot of these fabrics are fragile and they also have things like hooks and eyes or buttons. Um, and so if I were to handle that with gloves, I would lose some of the dexterity and tactility and be more likely to like snag my glove on something and cause damage that way. So um, it's better just to have freshly scrubbed hands. So like Christine said, just like surgeons, we scrubbed in before we came. Um, 
So and then how can you tell the difference between mis- machine stitching and hand stitching? Oh, it's so it's usually reasonably obvious. Um, with this one, they used kind of a running stitch. Can you pull it like up? Is that good? If you can get it closer, like I can't zoom in. Okay, I'm enough. sorry. Ah, thank you, Erica. Okay, so if you can see the kind of running stitch that's happening there versus a machine stitch, first of all, it's very, very even and there's no spaces between the stitches generally. With the early sewing machines, sometimes you'll see where they skip a stitch, but there won't be spaces missing. So yeah, that's some really, really nice fine handwork in a very nice straight line. That's really lovely. And yeah, if this was 70s, they could have used a machine. They could, that. yeah. But so it's interesting that yeah. they chose not to. Maybe grandma made it and you know, yeah, she maybe. made the leap to the sewing machine. <laughs> Ooh. Okay, this one I find fascinating because this is morning to me. Yeah, definitely. Um, the fact that it's, you know, straight black with a black fringe, yeah. unrelieved black. Yeah. Um, and I think there was also a tradition of dressing kids in white to mourn. So oh, that really? It, um, this one was in black is an interesting choice. Yeah. And probably a near relative, maybe a parent. Oh, yeah, that makes sense. And mourning was, um, it's a fascinating practice. The 19th century folks were very effusive um, with their grief and mourning um, was also based on, you know, class and financial means and inclination. You know, it it cost a lot to invest in a black wardrobe um, and all the black accessories. And so, you know, if you're um, a working class woman who is going to work in domestic service or in a factory, you know, you can't indulge in, you know, all black um, or, you know, dressing your kids, like having custom made black garments for your kids. But this family probably, you know, is affluent and did. Um, Would they be in mourning as long as adults? No. So there were degrees of mourning prescribed by etiquette, which again was sort of a matter of inclination, how tightly you followed it. Um, But widows were expected to have mourned the longest. They could mourn for up to two and a half years if they really wanted to go for it. Um, If you were mourning a parent, I think it was somewhere between three or six months. Um, If you're mourning a brother and sister, it's like six months. So depending on how close you were to the person. Okay. That's fascinating. Yeah, I never really knew kids did mourning, too. And someone else has asked, are these ever on display? You know what? I would love it if they are, but um, we have such extensive collections and so few um, or so small exhibit space comparatively that um, like the Frank answer is probably not. Um, That's why we were excited to put up the Fashion in Illinois exhibition. And that's why we do events like Tales from the Vault, um, because these are amazing things. And we really like to be able to make them accessible to the public. So if they're not on exhibit, we do like to try to feature them in programs make them available to researchers um but yeah that's a great question yeah if you haven't seen fashion in illinois you definitely should and someone else has asked do you have any men's clothes um we do and we can do go to the shirts later um i have to say we've got a much smaller proportion of men's clothing than we do women's clothing but we do have some pieces so this one is interesting and again christine i wanted to get your opinion because there's a tag huh. on this that says 1890, huh. and I don't know if I buy that. Uh, I don't know if I buy that either. That shoulder line looks awfully right? mid-century to yeah. me. <laughs> so the the 1860s was really characterized by this like dropped shoulder, and then kind of the high waist. It's it's just a little yeah. bit above the natural waist. And the, there are these cartridge pleats here. Yeah, like, yeah. everything about this is like 18. Like, yeah, 60s, 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 60s. Those buttons are great. Wow. Little fabric covered things. So if you were to find that in archaeology, what would that look like? Oh, gosh. Um, probably not much, if anything. Um, they might be wood core, so they'd never really be preserved archaeologically. Um I can't really tell just tapping it. They're so little. Sometimes you can tap it and kind of feel if there's metal or wood underneath it, but I can't tell which. So yeah, that is a problem with a lot of 19th century buttons is that they were just 
fabric covered bits of wood or bone or little teeny tiny metal rings that just kind of disintegrate in the ground. What's interesting about this too is um, you can see how yellowed it's gotten. Oh yeah. Like in wow. the front, it's very yellow. And yeah. there's this sort of place in her armpit that oh. didn't, you know, catch the sun or grime or whatever. Um, and so it's much, you know, brighter white. Yeah. That's pretty. And you think about all the environmental factors, you know, like chimneys, belching smoke, yeah. and fireplaces <laughs> and people smoking and, you know, just all the stuff in the air that would have. Yeah, just being done. Can you turn it over? Here. They want to know what it looks like on the back. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, pretty simple. underneath it's got that liner of cotton yeah so is this the front or the back of the dress this is the back yeah and yeah i guess that speaks to an 1860s if it's yeah. echoing a um an adult's garment because a lot of garments pre-1850 fastened in the back and then in the yeah. 1850s you start to see them fastened in the front, in the front yeah, and you start to see too. buttons in the 50s and 60s and yeah. what age would the child be that would wear this oh boy oh that's difficult i'm trying to like gauge based on my son he's um, <laughs> nine um five maybe five okay. or six okay Let's see. so much to see yes oh wow what is this this is an undergarment, I want to say. Yeah. So probably around 1900. I actually yeah. think we're looking at the back of this. Yeah, it looks so like it. Details in the front. There we go. Over. Ooh. And this one, huh. yeah, I just love how, like, rough this is. Yeah. Well, yeah, that kind of, I mean, I'm wondering if, like, this was at least partially meant to be seen, like, in the 20s, you know, with a mm -hmm. low-cut neckline, possibly. But this definitely was on. A yeah. little bit softer than you would think. I mean, it, it looks is, like actually. it would be burlap, but I think this is probably, you know, laundered a lot. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great thing about one. And the more you wash it, the softer it gets. That's neat. That's really neat. We've gotten a question. Were all garments lined? Oh. Um, that's, that's a difficult question. I don't. <laughs> think so um and you know some might be lined on the top but not on the skirt that would probably the skirt and, yeah you know. that would probably be the most common um it probably depends on the the fabric and yeah the class of the the buyer or the, right, the right. maker um i yeah i don't know there there were certainly some that were not lined and then were meant to be worn with like today <sighs> And I like this one because, okay, who um, watched Outlander and drooled over all the knitwear in Outlander from the 18th century? Oh, so yeah. this um, example of 19th century, you know, knit or crochet, and I'm not a knitter, so. Um, yeah, I was just wondering what, what here. This is actually, this is woven. Oh, doesn't that look crochet to me? I think it's woven. Yeah. Huh. That is interesting. It looks like a crochet stitch from far away, but when you get up close to it, look how the the yeah. threads are running. Yeah. Hmm. And some kind of like almost a twill sort of thing. Yeah, that's really interesting. I mean, it, it could be knit too. I don't want to pull on it too much to, to find out, but I know there are knit stitches that mimic weaving. And yeah, some of, I don't know, some of the edging kind of does sort of suggest maybe knitting. Oh, that's so fun. Oh, look at the, the little mending running through it here. I just decided to use it. I think it's actually, if we flip it over, it's got the size. Oh, little details oh the cool. Oh, that's utter, utterly adorable. <laughs> little tassel swinging. That's awesome. Okay. Okay. Groovy. So someone is asking, when you refer to archaeological terms and as far as garments, what are you talking about? Archaeological terms as far as Yeah, garments. you mentioned like in archaeology, would you find the buttons and that kind of thing? Yeah, we, we really only find the buttons and the buckles. Um, 
occasionally you'll see a piece of boning like from a side seam of a dress or a corset but that's pretty rare um that's really so are you doing archaeological digs to find these things are you i think that's their question oh okay well yeah i mean when when you dig a, a domestic site you do end up finding those things so those you know they get reported on just like anything else that you find at the site does like the ceramics and the glass and you know all the the metal bits and and what everything is so um yeah that's just kind of how archaeological reports are written where you go through the different classes of artifacts like that and try and say something about them that might reflect the people that lived on the site and archaeology is an amazing complement to material culture and museum studies because this is all very intentional right this is someone who had a garment and saved it and then passed it on so it survived and then donated it to the museum so it really kind of represents like the upper end of things yeah. um and for a long time museums were interested in best examples rather than you know representative of everyday life so it's this very self-selected like elite segment of material culture whereas archaeology is the stuff people left behind yeah they, you know the stuff they didn't want you to see but it's exactly. the stuff that's most representative <laughs> okay yeah, if you want to, if you want to know something about somebody that's real, go through their garbage. <laughs> and so this next one is fun. Um, this is, I mentioned, you know, a lot of times clothing has no clue and no context. This person was kind enough to leave their laundry mark on it. Oh, nice. um, this is a common practice for especially undergarments. Um, if there's a household that has a lot of people in it or they're sending out to um, have their laundry done by someone else, imagine all the white underwear in your house going into a giant boiling pot and then trying to return it to its proper owners afterwards. So a lot of people stamp their name on their underwear. So this is great because we, you know, this gives us some place to look. J.A. Stransky savannah illinois i actually looked him up before i came here and one of my favorite research sites is find a grave which catalogs all the gravestones across the united states so i found the stransky family in savannah illinois um, john stransky was an immigrant from austria what's interesting is that he didn't have any daughters with the initials J.A. His initials were J.A. Um, and then there was an infant daughter that died in 1881, which oh. this seems kind of big for a baby that died at yeah. less than one year old. So I wonder if he just had like a patriarch laundry stamp yeah. and like everyone <laughs> in his household had his laundry stamp, which I haven't seen before, but you know, I would buy it. I wouldn't put it past him. Yeah. Absolutely. Someone else has asked, why are the clothes in this particular box in different ages, but they're all in one box? Excellent um, question or comment. Um, so a lot of them came to us from um, University of Illinois. So these are grouped by like being children's clothes rather than chronology. Um, and it's as, it makes as much sense as anything to do it. Um, you know, a lot of it is kind of cataloging as a method of being able to locate items quickly. And if we had more time, we would kind of be more granular about the way that we organized it. But at least now we know, you know, this is in this box. And a caveat to that is that I also kind of assembled these before this video shoot to show you <laughs> interesting things. So this is like, you know, a, a created collection. Great. This one is fun. This is a fabric I've seen a lot in our collection. Ooh. And would you call this a wool flannel? Yeah. It's like Lindsay Woolsey kind of. And this is um, this butter yellow wool flannel is baby warm and cold yeah. weather. And yeah. I've seen this on like petticoats and like slips, mostly petticoats, I would say. Yeah, nice, nice, toasty warm on these. So I look at these buttons here. They're so wee. Look how tiny that is. And are those shell buttons? Yeah, it looks like it. And yeah, one of the interesting things that I read somewhere is that um, buttons on children's clothes typically have three holes. These obviously have four. Hmm. Uh, so again, I don't, think ah! are, I don't think there's any rules with buttons. <laughs> what kind of garment is this? This is the um, 
like a baby dress, you know, just kind yeah, of a nightgown. Just a generic. For um, children under the age of one, they were typically in what's called long clothes or long dresses. And for kids who weren't yet walking, um, you know, they're just sitting there. So you tuck the bottom around the baby's feet and they're nice and cozy warm. And then typically as they become toddlers, they go into short clothes and that lets their little legs move around. Um, and then how did they get the scalping at the bottom? Oh, I don't know. Is that hand done? Uh, yeah, it looks like that's hand done. So probably what they did is they stitched this pattern in um, with a straight seam. And then they went along with a pair of really fine scissors and cut along the scalloped edge because you can see the little bits of the fabric underneath. Oh my underneath. gosh, you're a genius. Yeah. <laughs> A little, little bit of a hole there, but that one's in really good shape. Oh, fun. So what is this? Here's another dress. It says um, somewhere there's a note that it's 1873, I think. So okay. We have a precise date for it. This is, oh, this is an example of the top yeah. hooking to the bottom, yeah. which I guess makes sense for a small child. Uh -huh. Keep everything in order. Yeah. And these buttons, oh, they're, they're like your buttons. Yeah. Okay. And I love the little hanky. Oh. oh my goodness, look at that. It's still got the folds in it. Wow. And this little girl is probably being taught how to, you know, hem hankies on her own at this point. Oh, yeah, definitely. Good night. Yeah, that's really pretty. Lovely stuff. And the last one, um, this is a wealthy child's dress. Ooh. And so after a certain age or if you're a certain income bracket, the style really was to dress your children like miniature adults. So this kid, um, you know, they went all out with the <laughs> lace and the ribbons. This is also a reflection of the time when um, sewing machines become more popular. And so sewing machines were supposed to save time and labor because you could sew so much faster. But in response, fashion got a lot more elaborate, thinking like, OK, now that you can, you know, let's do lace and bows and ribbons and ruches and ruffles and whatever. Yeah. So like it's definitely a more is more aesthetic. Yeah. That's definitely what this is, too. It kind of reminds me, honestly, of some of the kids' portraiture from the 18th century from right. very wealthy yes. children. Because it's so elaborate. This lace is absolutely stunning. And it's got like, a little bit of a bustle back here. Oh, my this gosh. Is, I would say probably around 1880. Yeah. Ooh, look at all those buttons. I can oh, say this child hated wearing this outfit. <laughs> <laughs> Most likely. Those are fun. Oh my gosh, they're really cold. I wonder if they're glass. Huh. Huh. Oh man. Yeah, the lace. Just love the lace. Oh my gosh. Net lace is something that was a really, really great 19th century fashion that's really kind of difficult to find anymore with the, the cotton net. They just don't make cotton net that fine anymore. Okay, should we move on to the man's shirt? All right, yeah. So let's question about men's garments. This is something that came to us um, within the last couple of years. Um, this is from a family who never threw anything away and has all their family artifacts dating back to the early 1800s. And so this was a treasure. I was thrilled when I found this. Yeah, this is such classic 19th century shirt construction too. I mean, really some of it goes back to the 18th century. Um, the way that, so everything was made out of rectangles of fabric. So you see there's a seam right here under the arm to shape it to your body, which of course isn't a rectangle. And then this also allowed for, you can take this out when it gets stained and replace it. Um, and then there's these nice, lovely little reinforcements on the side here. See how the, it's split from about the waistline down. And then they didn't want it to rip there. So they re And then this, this kind of like, shape right here. This is all double layer of fabric 
So that's where most of the wear is when you're wearing a vest on top of there, it's going to kind of cut right across there and potentially wear through the fabric. So having two layers of fabric there really helps with the wear. Oh yeah. And then this collar was really nice too. Again, this is classic 18th, 19th century construction. With the you pulled it up this <laughs> So it's got a, a little triangular gusset here. This is the top of the shoulder. So this is the peak of the shoulder going down to the arm. And then this is the collar. And so the collar was fitted on with this little triangular gusset. So we've got a question. Was this hand stitched or done by machine? Ah, uh, let's look. Definitely hand stitched. Is it definitely hand stitched? It is. Because this one came with a little note pinned to it, which we love. And it said, Father's Wedding Shirt Made by Grandma. Oh, and, that's know, awesome. Father is Z.A. Enos, oh, which is Zimri Enos of Springfield. And his <laughs> mother was um, Salome Enos. And we know that he got married in 1846. Oh, that's so cool. Man. Yeah, I love this ruffle too this is really super super fine fabric you can see right through it is the ruffle made from a different material yes it is it's very different and yeah the collar because we decide that the collar or at least the collar is so i mean i think the shirt is all linen but it's yeah. different grades of linen yeah right? yeah and then someone else asked would you wear an ash pot with this or is the ruffle bid meant to imitate that um, in the 40s, I think it wasn't an ascot. It would have been um, a cravat. A cravat, like, like, yes. It wraps around your neck. Yeah. So, yeah, that would have gone around the high collar here. So you would wear that and, and the ruffle. Yes. Okay. Yeah, super fashionable. And a ruffled shirt was a, like it was a fancy shirt, right? Yeah. And sometimes yeah. when people are making fun of like, you know, dandies, they're like, yeah. oh, this guy in his ruffled shirt. Yeah. You know? <laughs> so this is like his nice, you know, it was its wedding shirt he yeah. for a special occasion. And yeah. the embroidery here, um, this is like the early um, version of that underpant mark, you know, again, same principle. It's like a white shirt that's going to be washed with a bunch of white shirts. And so Zimri knows that this is like the sixth of his collection of how many shirts he has. So yeah. they're often numbered like that. That's a, yeah, that's embroidery, by the way. Those itty bitty teeny tiny stitches are all done by hand. Let's bring it up to the camera <laughs> so people can see. Yeah, the, uh, the um, seamstress work on this is just incredible. Like they're all like these tiny, tiny, tiny little fine yeah. stitches. Yeah, it's amazing. Show the, the oh, God, that's beautiful. Yeah, that fabric's amazing too. It's one of those super fine linens that almost feels like silk. This one is super fun. And I looked at this before you came, Christine. Okay. Um, and so what I think happened here is I think this is a, um, a wrapper, which is like an at-home garment. Not a, it's like a house dress, basically. And I think this is, again, like a Frankenstein monster of, you know, oh, wow. something remade from an old dress. Yeah. Because, like, this collar, this spoofy collar, and the, like, vertical detail, that seems like 1870s to me. Yeah, definitely. But, like, this fabric on the inside. Definitely, like, 30s, 40s. 30s, yeah. 40s right? <laughs> yeah. So, like, someone took an old dress and, like, and this is. Oh, early one too. Yeah, right? it does look early. Oh my gosh, that's so fascinating. Gosh, I love people. They're so creative. And that was, I mean, that was what people did when their yeah. garment. If you could make it over for like outside wear again, then you take the salvageable parts, and it could turn into you know the lining, the lining yeah. of a garment. So we've got you know someone reaching back to with 30, 40 year old fabric that they're repurposing for a. Fairly stylish wrapper. Yeah, that's really cool. And do you think um, with this drawstring here, do you think that's a pregnancy accommodation? Oh gosh, it's possible. Uh, how much does that actually take? I don't know. I mean, looks like it takes an inch fair amount. It's, it sits like kind of high too. Like oh this, yeah, it does. It's like that's higher of, than the well, well, and these the way these buttons are with these loops kind of makes me think too that like this is meant to be like give some room, yeah. <laughs> you know. 
That's fascinating. Yeah. And, oh, neat. And there's like different um, lining fabric inside. Ooh. So someone commented here that drawstrings are common in wrappers made from existing dresses. Oh, ah. awesome. That makes sense because it's the easiest way yeah, to is. Love it. <laughs> like this is the most fun to me is when, you know, not some pristine garment that someone wore once and put in a box, yeah. but like that lived and got remade. Yeah. That's so fun. Oh my gosh. So here is um, a corset from around the year 1900. And this one is fun because it's a... It's a nursing corset, isn't it? Oh my gosh. I've never seen that before. That's so cool. So Sarah's a new mom. Sarah, this is <laughs> perfect for you. <laughs> wow. So, you know, convention dictated that you should be in that corset. Yeah. Actually, there were maternity corsets, weren't they? Yeah, there were. Corsets yeah. While pregnant. Yeah. Usually they have uh, <laughs> something like on the side here. Well, the ones that I've seen are earlier, so the corset's a bit longer. Um, but they'll have um, like an open bit like this, only it laces up on the side. So you can kind of accommodate oh, the growing right. baby bump. That's really neat, though. Unfortunately, we don't have the laces. Yeah. Oh. And then um, this is fun. This is a combination. Ooh. So for most of the 19th century, um, after um, drawers started to be used, it was like you had your chemise and your drawers, but this is combining it all into like a one-piece garment. So you've got your top and your bottom. Oh, that's so pretty. Wow. Can almost wear that as a dress today. Oh, I know. How would someone would? I think that's a thing. I Is think it? people take like <laughs> underpinnings and corset covers and stuff and turn them into garments. Yeah. And if it's not a thing, it should be. Along, so much to be. Yeah. Here's a, here's a pair of drawers. Oh, those are nice. So when they were first introduced and then well past the Civil War, they're split um, for ease of using the restroom. Um, I don't know what people did when they stopped being split. That seems like it would cause some problems. Yeah, I never thought about that. But, um, oh. And again, the embroidery, your name on your um, waistband to keep track of it in the laundry. Do you think this would have, this beading lace would have had a ribbon in it originally? Oh, yeah, but that, probably. Gosh, so much like, you know, attention to detail yeah. on <laughs> beauty on your underwear. Yeah. Maybe one more undergarment and then move on to accessories. Okay. And someone's asked, how can these be cleaned? And if so, how? Um, so if I were like today, as since they're making environments, we have a sex conservator that we work with and I send them to him and he does his, you know, pH neutral magic with them. In the 19th century, you throw it in a pot of boiling water and scrub it. And that's why a lot of these garments were white is because white can withstand um, the brutal scrubbing process that undergarments went through. So here's, um, there's a lot of petticoats from the 19th century and you can kind of establish a date by the clues they give you. So this one I would say is 1880s, 1890s because okay. it's got this like um, is that called board? Oh, it's yeah, not yeah. Cor cartridge pleated. This yeah, board construction uh -huh. is a new innovation, but it's also got a teeny little accommodation for a bustle yeah, here. Okay. So this is, um, and that was a silhouette of the 1890s. This little kind of like booty bump. <laughs> so you kind of have to look at it and think of like. You know, when you're holding it up and it's two dimensional, it's like okay. I but wanted to see shoes, and this box says shoes, so. Oh, man. Oh, this is going to be fun. Whoa. Awesome. Oh, that's too cool. So these, I would probably say, are like 1920s-ish. Yeah, teens, 20s, maybe. Which is funny because when you think of the, like, stereotypical flapper and, like, the mini skirt and the beaded, you know, she's always wearing spike heels. Like, the heel was pretty, <laughs> like, clunky in the 20s. They yeah. actually didn't have, like, stiletto pumps in the 20s. 
these are really nicely balanced though this would probably be really comfortable or really. And then I love these because oh. I like older things. Oh my lord. But this is a side lace shoe. Uh, so this is like 18 what? 30s, 40s, yeah. 50s. It's definitely pre Civil War. Yeah, I would say probably 40s or 50s. Um, I think the 30s didn't really have a heel yet, generally. Yeah, good point. It was, and these flat, are. Um, wow. These are. The same, right? Yeah, they're single last, yeah. So this was before um, they made right and left shoes. So you would get two identical shoes and then your feet would just kind of break them. Actually, I think it probably went like this. Yeah, right? it looks like it. Your feet would turn them into <laughs> right and left shoes with wear, but they didn't come that way. They're so tiny. Yeah, they're... Oh, no, they are so small. And a lot of times um, that kind of drives their preservation in museum collections. Again, shoes got reused like everything. And yeah. so if your feet were really small, you know, there's less of a chance you can pass it on to someone. Very true. Yeah, everybody in the, the vintage community is always kind of saying, oh, vintage clothes are so small. Vintage shoes are so small. Everybody must have been so much smaller back then. And like, yes, a little bit, but also, like you just said, the small stuff survived because nobody else could wear it. Um, oh, goodness. Okay, I'm going to need Eric to help with this one. I don't really know much about bonnets. Wow, that's a lovely color, though. That is a winter bonnet. Yeah, it's like quilted. This is all like padded. Oh, and it's got that nice glazed cotton inside. Oh, is there a date on this? 65? 1865. Okay, okay. Nice. Well, wow. that's helpful. Yeah. And like way out of my depth in terms of <laughs> dating bonnets. Yeah, me too. Do you think, see, like, yeah, this, year? this was reused, wasn't it? Maybe it was a, a garment before they made it into a bonnet. Oh, interesting. Who knows? Show the camera. <laughs> yeah, so we're, what we're looking at here is it looks like there's a seam that's been unpicked that goes across like that. Very neat. Do you have one more box to show? One more time. All oh, right. So yeah, like Erica was saying, there's not a whole lot of range to this collection as far as ethnicity. And um, when we were here before, I just happened to see that there was a box marked kimono. And there's no provenance with this. We don't know where it came from or how it ended up in central Illinois. But this is the most beautiful example I've ever seen of this Yuzen dye technique. This is a very formal Japanese kimono from pre-World War II. It's called a Kuro Tomasobe. And the dye technique is all done by hand uh, with a resist dye and then painted by hand on top of the resist. And there's a little bit of uh, gold leaf work in it too. So, and then I don't know if you can see the lining. This is a very, very bright red lining, which is very common with these formal kimono. So, uh, can you hold it up a little so I can get the bottom? Oh, okay. Try and get. A little bit at the bottom here. Thank you. There we go. Oh, perfect. So, who would have worn this? Well, um, nowadays, really, these are worn for very formal occasions. So, like, anything you would wear a black tie suit to, um, if you're the mother of bride or groom and you're going to your kid's wedding, you wear one of these. Um, so this would have been very formal. It probably would have been worn um, in the winter time, or maybe, like, late winter or early spring, based on the motif. Um, yeah, this was a really really big surprise in the collection. This is an absolutely gorgeous piece. Is there a seam on the waist? Yes, there is. Um, there's a seam that runs right along here. The lining has um, quite a bit of a seam in it. 
Um, the seaming in kimono is, is a little different than Western style clothing. It's all cut in rectangles, um, a little bit like that men's shirt we saw before. So it's, it's very straight lines. And yeah, that was really, really fascinating. Absolutely beautiful piece. It's all hand sewn um, based on the, the size of the crests are quite large, maybe like two inches across. So it's definitely pre-World War II. I would say um, probably not as old as Meiji era, um, but definitely early Showa or possibly Taisho. Oh, yeah, there we go. Awesome. <laughs> and are we out of time now? Ah, well, uh, thank you perfect. so much for coming along. I hope everybody had as much fun as we did. Um, though obviously, we've just like hit the very tip of the iceberg. But if anyone has any questions about our collections, um, feel free to email me. My email is erika, E R I K A dot host, H-O-L-S-T, at illinois.gov. And if you haven't gotten a chance to see um, Fashioning Illinois, please go over and check it out. The museum's open from Tuesdays through Saturdays. So thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks, Christine, for yeah, being here. Thanks, Erica. This was great. <laughs>